am I doing God's will? And last week we talked a little bit about where I actually focused on the last verse. Um, anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And I'm just going to read through the scripture again. And it's from uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world more than the things it offers you. But when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. Those are the three things I'm going to look at real quick this morning. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. And in that scripture we looked at last week, but everyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And I tried to look at some points of what we need to follow. And the first part of doing God's will, the most important thing, the basic thing, is accepting his son as your savior and knowing that we are all sinners. And because he was perfect, that the sins that he did not do, our sins are taken care of. I just want to remind you that. The word world is said six times in those three verses. First of all, God created the world in Genesis, and we've all read through that. As a matter of fact, Gavin and I had our Sunday school lesson this morning looked at creation and how there's a difference in what the Bible says is the number of years that the earth is old versus what the uh, uh, scientists have to say. Some of them, that secular scientists, believe how old it is. And he looked at all the different things and actually got quite a bit of of uh, physics for, for Gavin of uh, carbon-14 versus carbon-12 versus 9, nitrogen-12. But he explained it pretty good of how all those things are not cut in concrete of how long carbon-14 lasts. It changes with the world and all the different things. So it was really good to do that. So God actually loves the world. In John 3.16, of course, God so loved the world that he gave us one begotten son for us. God created the creatures, the flowers, the beauty, you and I, but in the scripture, but in this scripture, the world is presented as an evil system. This system is under the influence of greed, under the influence of evil men, and even of the devil himself. Verse 16 gives us three phases I want you to quick look at. The cravings of sinful, of sinful man, or the lust of the flesh, some of your versions will say, or a craving for physical pleasure. These all are ways of saying this principle of worldliness from which the love of the world flows. So if you think of those things, the love of the world, of how those things will be corrupted, so to speak. Flesh has a tendency to selfishly pursue matters that want to satisfy our own flesh, our own desires. We pursue this in spite of our fellow person's interests, of what they need and what would be good for them. And, we, and it's also independent of God himself. When we pursue the flesh, it will become the basis of our own rebellion against the spirit of God. As is evidence through all of mankind's existence and today, the law is despised, the law is mocked, and the flesh will do all it can to disobey the law. And most of you probably have heard people take the law and twist it, and they take it out of context. That hasn't just been going on today. It's been going on before. I think of the one that started World War II. He used that a fair amount, too. So it's something that's done, and that's the flesh getting involved, because he wants to satisfy the readings and the writings of the scripture to his way of looking at it. When the flesh overdoes things, it changes honorable tasks and pursuits into materialism. And it's also being egocentric. It changes behavior into being selfish and into taking advantage of others or of the situation. And we all have that tendency when we look it back, and that's sin. And we need to capture that and say, God, what is your way of doing this? How do you want me to do it? It is what happens when evil and flesh get mixed together. It's like, yeah, kind of like a little chemistry formula. The craving of the flesh will lead to the love of injustice. We see that happening into sexism and racism. It will despise the poor and lead to neglecting the helpless, actually to try to enable them and give them things so that they'll become even more dependent, the poor and the weak. It ultimately leads to unrighteous behavior, the love of the flesh, the craving of the flesh. Number two, <clears throat> craving for everything we see or lust of the eyes. When we look at that phrase, we usually migrate to sexual lust. And that is very real and prevalent in society today 
has been in the past, as it was in the time of Jesus, as it been since the fall of man. This lust is endless. And when you look at the lust, when we look at everything we see, property, clothing, jewelry, power, even a job, or, or job status, how about work, how about even in the church, how about the car that you have, or the tractor you have, and it's on and on. I'm just pointing out some things that wants to be the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is easily captured by what we see on the outside, an outside show that we have, versus what is actually happening in the inside of our situation ourselves. And, uh, you know, I always look and I admire Roger and his garden and how he makes his tomato plants grow the right way and he cooks them, hooks them all together. I throw a piece of metal down in the thing and hope they do best and it starts tipping over. They haven't been trimming like they should. I always kind of envy what Roger does with his tomato garden. And it's just a, a lust that I have for the, imitate his way. I always want to hire him and have him come out and do my garden. But no, I do my garden, but I learn and just have to be patient and do more things with it. So we can learn from those things, but it's there of the different things that we see. This is shown profoundly by greed and by desire or lust for things we see as we go out and look at the magazine or the TV, or dare I say, the internet. Amazon.com. As soon as you look at something, all of a sudden on the side of your computer, there's ads showing up for it. Hmm, even bigger or better. Uh, so, and then remember, there are three quick references in the Bible, at least I can, that I wrote down, uh, lust of the eyes. Genesis 3, what did Eve, Eve lust for? The fruit, the fruit of that one tree they wasn't supposed to. How about Joshua 7, A-C-H-A-N, Akan? Remember, he stole items that he took them with him when they had captured, uh, what's that, how do you say it? I said Aiken. Aiken? Aiken. Yeah. yeah, there's a city in Minnesota called Aiken. It's not spelled that way, but that's all right. Oh. Aiken, but second, second Samuel 11, what did David do? The lust of the eyes as he was on top of his palace and looking down. Both of them are at fault. He shouldn't have been up there. He should have been doing some other things. She kind of probably knew that he was present up there someplace doing things. So lust of the eyes can be a very big thing. Number three, pride of life, or pride in our achievements and possessions, or another word that one of the versions uses is boasting. This phrase only occurs in the Bible here, in this place and in James 4.16, 1 John 2.16 and James 4.16. This phrase describes someone who glorifies in himself and in his possessions. And you've all seen people like that. This person can be a pompous hypocrite. If someone or else others wants our image to stand out more than our neighbor's image or God's glory, that is not good. And I'm always surprised at how many homes some of the people in authority have, and I'm always and the value of some of them, and uh, just boggles my mind. It's hard enough keeping one house and one yard going. Of course, they hire a lot of the work done, but that is a form of idol worship of having those things. Pride of life means that we show off whatever status symbol is important to me. It tells you and the world what, we identi what, what my identity is when we do that. Here are some examples how I might define myself to others that show my pride of life. My income, how about my fancy or expensive car, maybe a boat, maybe the house, add on to it. I see sometimes farmers with their bigger, better tractors, combines. Some of them are very practical. They got a lot of acres to run and get it out. But they always seem like they want the newest, biggest thing to keep going. How about uh, the number of good books that my bookshelves have on there that maybe I've read some of them, maybe they're just there, I ordered them, got them, uh, never got time to read them. How about even the reputation of the church that I attend? That can be one. How about my degrees and my grades and my awards that I got? When I do these things, I have succumbed to the pride of life. I am misrepresenting the truth and not bringing glory to the one who created all that we see. And verse 17 summarizes the previous verses this way. All of the vanity, all of the displays of this evil world with all of its devices is passing away and dying. The things of the world has already begun to rot and smell. 
when an animal's dead, I can tell when I step out of the veterinary truck that there's a dead animal in this presence. It's there. And that's what's happening in this world already. It essentially is a corpse that has not yet been buried. The things of this world. But when you and I do the will of God in our lives, we have his breath of eternal life. And we need to have that. God's will is noble and provable. Keep that in mind. It's provable through the scripture, through the word of God. If you say something, you make sure you read it in context and proclaim it according to God's word. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing, and we sang the song this morning, and perfect his will really is. Perfect. And I've got two scriptures I added since I did this, and you can write them in your thing. Uh, first one is Hebrews 10, 14. Nancy, I've got to read that one. For by that one offering, the offering was Jesus Christ, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. That's you and I. When we accept Jesus Christ into our lives, he's the one that's made the offering for us. Note the word perfect. This verse does not say God made it better or made us better. God didn't say, he enhances my life. He enhances me. But what he actually does is he completes us. He makes us complete through Jesus Christ. And the reality is that we will stand, we will still stumble, and I do that. And we will at times make an error. Sometimes we do something that we said we weren't going to do. But that part of us is being made holy, as the scripture says. As we learn, as we grow, and we accept Jesus, and we repent. That's what we have to do when we do something wrong. And it comes back to us and says, oh, I didn't do it quite the right way. And I repent. Lord, I want, I want you to be, I want to listen to your spirit the next time I do it. When it comes to our position before God, we are perfect because of what Jesus did for us. Perfect gift. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ, and God the Father sees us as perfect because Jesus is perfect. He was perfect when he was with mankind and gave his life for us. When he gave his perfect life for us, the enemy was defeated. Death is defeated. And we are his creation. And then the final verse I have that I looked up, Colossians 3.10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. It tells us that we are being made new and we are becoming like the one who made us, Jesus Christ. If you want to stand with me, we'll close with prayer. Lord, I thank you that we can follow your will. And as we follow your will, as we, it's proclaimed in your scriptures, in your word that you gave to us. So, Lord, thank you for your word. And I pray that for each one of us as we go forth this day, from here forward, Lord, that we follow. Am I doing the will of God? Yes, I am. I'm not doing it perfectly, but I am going to make every effort that I can to follow his will, to do the things that he wants us to do. I am not pursuing the things of the world. Um, I am part of the world, and I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And I pray that for everyone here. Not be of the world. We do have to exist. We do have to be there. I'm not calling you to be a certain sect that uh, wears dark clothing. When Nancy and I got to see that a couple of weeks ago and uh, don't have electricity, things like that. Or they have electricity in the barn but not the house. That's kind of weird. But God is calling us to pursue what he has for us. So let the embrace of the Father be the comfort in your life. Let the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, be the one that you rely on. Let the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you every hour that you breathe on this earth. Let the three in one be the focus of all that is in you. Go in his peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed. There's prayer for healing on the north side. And Charles and I are available afterwards.